Now, I've met with several of you about the exam, and I've had, I think, good discussions with a lot of you that came by my office tomorrow between 8 and 3 or whenever I left. And some of you asked me to provide this information, which I had provided after the last test as well. I'm not sure it's necessarily useful, but for those of you that wanted it, this is the assignment of the different exam questions, the point values of those questions, how they were related to the tasks from those two chapters, mitosis and meiosis. I just numbered the tasks and wrote down which question applied to which of those goals for those topics. And then specifically, some of you had asked about um, which of the questions were supposed to be the different Bloom's levels, easy or factual recall, that is, F-ish level questions to the more advanced Bloom's level like create things, which are the more A level questions. And not surprisingly, most of the class wound up getting questions like one and five right, and less of the points on the higher value questions. So for what it's worth, you ask for it, there's some information about the exam. Are there any questions about anything, topics, course content, course mechanics, before we get going? We're going to work a bit through a little bit of the vocabulary for sex chromosomes today. Specifically, we're going to talk about the X, Y, Z, and W chromosomes and the terms heterogamity and homogamity. We probably will not do, we have been covering, of course, over the last several classes, chi-square testing. In the context of today, we're going to get to the context of the genetics of sex. What's your expectation for how many children from a couple should be boys versus girls or XY versus XX? And go from there. So that's one of the reasons we've been working on the chi-square test, to be able to do that sort of analysis. And we probably will not, in this topic, but next topic, talk about activation and repression. So those last two vocabulary items down there on the left. More related to genes and the central dogma, which we're getting into as soon as we finish with sex chromosomes. And at this point, we've been talking about the bottom two tasks there, using statistics. So coming up with expected outcomes and then testing the expectations with observed data. And we've already talked about the bottom point, which is why do we have approximately the same number of XX and XY humans? We're going to review that as part of today's class. And finally, one of the keys for today is that top task. We're going to talk about predicting sexes based on karyograms. We've been looking at chromosomes a lot this semester. This is another way to apply our understanding of what chromosomes look like and how that connects to sex and sex chromosomes. So that's where we're headed today. X, Y, Z, W chromosomes and predicting the sex of individuals based on their karyograms. What do you think we have on the right side of the screen? X and Y chromosomes. Okay, which one's the X chromosome and which one's the Y chromosome? The big one's the X chromosome. The little one's the Y chromosome. And it's kind of unfortunate. It's an electron micrograph. Not the usual way we're used to looking at chromosomes, but it's another way to not photograph them, but micrograph them, take microscopic images of them. They're not called the X and the Y because they actually look like an X and a Y as shown up here. That's not entirely true. By the way, there's one sister chromatid, one of the two double helices, the two sister chromatids at metaphase, which is when this micrograph was taken. So likewise, you can't see really the short arm of the Y chromosome, but it's got one sister chromatid there as well. So one of the key things about the Y chromosome is it's a lot smaller than the X chromosome, but it wasn't always like that. The X and the Y chromosome, 300 million years ago, abbreviate that MYA, were the same size. They were another autosome pair. They were the 23rd autosome pair, chromosome 23. And we can tell this because we can look at other species that were derived from the common ancestor of humans about that length of time ago, about 300 million years ago, 
and look at the state of their chromosomes in other descendant species today. We can predict back, this is an evolutionary concept, what existed 300 million years ago, they were the same chromosome. For example, they would have the same genes in the same order on the same sister chromatids. They could have different versions of genes, like different alleles. But the X and the Y chromosome used to be not X and Y. These used to just be another boring old, look the same from paternal version and maternal version set of chromosomes. And it's only over those 300 million years that one of those two chromosomes, the first thing that happened was it picked up an extra gene. When I mean picked up, I mean a new gene was created. Evolution created a new gene. And that gene was the gene that caused male sex determination, which I'm going to abbreviate there MSD, male sex determination. It's a gene that would turn on the formation of male features in any organism that had that gene. It's a master sex determination gene. It's the primary trigger. It's the first trigger. It's like flipping the switch that turns on male sex determination. So master sex determining gene, male sex determining gene in this case, but only on one of the two. That is, that gene didn't exist on the other homologue at first, and it never did. So this was a genetic distinction between these two chromosomes 300 million years ago was that one of the chromosome 23s had a gene that would cause male sex determination and male development. The other one did not. This is the entire definition of, of a sex chromosome. A sex chromosome is the chromosome that carries a gene that turns on or activates a sex determination cascade, the initiator of sex development. So at that point in time, as soon as that gene landed there on one chromosome, not both, just on one, that defined that chromosome as being a Y chromosome. That is, the chromosome that contains the gene that causes maleness, we define as the Y chromosome. The X chromosome, it's homologue. They're still called homologs because they were derived, they descended, they evolved from the same homolog pair, the 23rd chromosomes, the 23rd chromosome pair. That means the one that doesn't have the gene that causes maleness we call the X chromosome. Just functional definitions. And since the period of time when the Y chromosome, as soon as it gained that gene that controls male sexual development, since then it's been literally falling apart. And that's why it looks like it physically does today. Back 300 million years ago, you couldn't tell the difference between the two chromosomes, the X and the Y. They looked exactly the same, other than this presence or absence of this one gene. But the presence of maleness through a long and arduous series of chromosomal deletions and other just general falling apartness, the Y chromosome degenerated into its tiny self today. So it still has that male sex determining gene on it, but a lot of the other genes that it used to have 300 million years ago have all degenerated. They've fallen apart, mutations have taken over the Y chromosome. It's losing chunks of DNA regularly as it moves through time and moves from individual to individual, and now it's this sort of shrunken relic of what it used to be. And the X chromosome's perfectly fine. So guys were falling apart, but this, is te this tends to be what happens to sex chromosomes. And I hope that you will learn more about this in Biology 105 when you get there if you're a biology major and you have to take 105, about why it is, the theory behind why sex chromosomes literally degenerate. They fall apart, they get degraded, and they just become these little runty things. And their main job then in humans is what? What does the Y chromosome do? It causes sex determination. It triggers male sexual development. That's about all it does now. It used to be a normal chromosome. It used to have genes all across the chromosome. Basically now, the Y chromosome has that sex determination gene, which the gene in humans is called SRY. Not for sorry, although that is a good thing for guys to know. But... <laughs> guys. Um, it's it stands for 
something else that we'll get into probably next class. But the name of the gene that causes male sexual development in humans is called SRY. And it's one of the only genes on the Y chromosome. X chromosome has thousands of genes. And back 300 million years ago, both of those chromosomes, the, the soon-to-be Y and the soon-to-be X, still had lots of genes. But today, the male Y chromosome has gotten rid of most of its genes. It has SRY. It has a handful of other genes, most of which are involved in spermatogenesis and fertility. So basically, the Y chromosome is a package of genes that are involved in male sexual development and reproduction. Yeah. So what do male sexual genes Free for all? <laughs> okay, so that's a fantastic question. The question was, before we had a gene that controlled sex, what happened? How did sex determination occur? And you raise one possibility, which is that it could have been environmental sex determination. So it's important to note here, so thank you again for bringing this up, that these are heterogamity and homogamity are forms of genetic sex determination. It's not the only way that all the animals and plants on the planet do sex determination. In other words, we use a gene to trigger sexual development. Some species don't. Some species, like a lot of amphibians and reptiles, use temperature. The temperature at which the embryos develop dictates whether they become male or female. So it's possible that 300 million years ago, that was the system. And then we got this gene, SRY, that controls sex. So maybe it's a good time to reflect on what's the... <coughs> benefit of doing sexual um, chromosomal sex determination? Why is it, is it better or worse to have a gene that controls sex and a chromosome that controls sex? Well, I know people find that genetic is affecting a lot of reptile populations, but I mean, there is, like, sex variation within species, so that can be bad for reproduction and, like, survival of the species in the long term. Right. So it's an important theory. Let's say... At cool temperatures, and it depends, depending on which species you look at, which sex develops at a warm temperature versus a cool temperature. But let's say at warm temperatures, embryos develop as females, and at cool temperatures, embryos develop as males. If you're a sexually reproducing species, what's really important about sexual reproduction? <coughs> let's see. You have to have both sexes, right? If you're a sexually reproducing species, if you're going to reproduce, you have to have males and females? Yes? Yes, in the back. Are you with me? <laughs> males and females are important for sex. Wow, well, I shouldn't have said that so loud. <laughs> so what happens to these species as climate change increases? As, as, the, as the planet warms, there are fewer cooler temperatures left. So what we have in this case, fewer males. And so what if at some point, none of the embryos that are developing develop as males? It's called extinction. You've got no more reproduction. So the, that species goes extinct. And most reptiles and a lot of amphibians use environmental sex determination to determine the sex of offspring. And so there needs to be that balance of temperatures that are cool enough to make some males and some females so that reproduction can occur. So I'm going to skip ahead to a slide that's in here somewhere, but I'll just skip past it once we get there. We talked about this last class or two classes ago. What is, if you start with an XY cell, and this is going to be meiosis, and four gametes are going to be produced, how many of them contain Xs and how many contain Ys? We go synthesis, we get two X's and two Y's. They're all sister chromatids because, as we just talked about, these are all related chromosomes. They all used to be the 23rd chromosome. So they still pair up at meiosis, X's and Y's. And then at the first division, the X's will go together into one of the cells and the Y's stick together. That's the first division. Sister chromatids don't segregate. And then the second division, they segregate. So you get an X in two gametes and the Y in the other two. What does this do for our sex ratio? 
How many, what, do you remember what the sex or the chromosomal sex of the oocyte is? What sex chromosome the oocyte has? It will always have an X because females are genetically XX. So every oocyte they produce will contain an X chromosome, not a Y chromosome. So 50% of the time, at random during fertilization, half of offspring will get an X from the dad and be XX and produce females, female daughters, genetically female daughters. And the other half of the time, males will have sperm that produce the carry Ys, and those will combine with the oocyte to produce XY embryos or sons. That's the great thing about genetic sex determination is because of the way meiosis works, if there's one X chromosome and one Y chromosome, then half of the gametes, half of the sperm get Xs, half the sperm get Ys, and our sex chromosome ratio, our sex ratio is 50% XX, 50% XY. In other words, we don't have to, well, we do have to worry about a planet that's heating up, but not for sex. Sex chromosomes dictate that basically, on average, humans are half XX and half XY. Half of humans are XX and half of humans are XY. That's the nice thing about genetic sex determination. And then we have to worry about the fact that the Y chromosome falls apart as time proceeds. Conversation for evolution. Does anybody know of a famous organism, that, another famous organism that does environmental sex determination? Movies have been written about it. Well, at least one movie. A cartoon from a decade plus ago. Lots of sequels since. <coughs> about a little fish. His name was Nemo. Right, clownfish. Clownfish do environment, lots of fish do environmental sex determination as well. Some have chromosomes, as we'll see in a minute, but fish do environmental sex determination too. And clownfish have this odd, to us maybe, form of environmental sex determination where the society, it's called social sex determination. So here's my, oh man, that's a horrible fish. I don't even know how to draw a fish. Let's see. There we go. That's still a bad, yeah, feel free. Go for it. So there can be a number of fish in a population. And in clownfish, the largest fish is female. And all of the other fish are males. So there's one breeding female. There's one female in the whole population that live around the corals. There's one, the biggest fish is a female. X, actually not X, no sex chromosomes, just a female. And all of the other fish are males. And the biggest male, let's say it's this guy on top here, is the breeding male. And he will mate with, cross with, the one female. He's the dominant male. All the other males are kind of small and runty. And they get like put down and suppressed by the alpha male. What happens if the big male disappears or dies? Then the next biggest male is the biggest male. So he becomes the breeding male, and then he will mate with the female. What happens when the female dies or disappears? The biggest fish changes sex and turns from male to female and starts, stops producing sperm and starts producing oocytes. So this big male, I guess, then becomes female. And then the second biggest male becomes the breeding male and mates with female. So these, do, these are fish that do sex change during life, if they get the chance. But it's social. It's all about the other fish that live around. So that somehow they can sense that there's no more female left, and somehow the biggest male produces the most hormone or something, gives them a signal to change sex and start producing oocytes. Yeah? So these fish have the same like external genitalia, or genitalia, I guess, and just throughout life, if something happens, then a chemical change happens with them, them to make different gametes? I think that's the simple way to put it. I don't know the details, but yes, I didn't, see, I didn't hear anything wrong with that description. All right. Yep. They, they start out flexible, I guess, is the, the best way to put it. And so hormonal changes can cause 
some sexual traits to further develop, so they maybe start life with underdeveloped oocytes or ovaries and genitalia that then will finish <coughs> development when the society indicates that it's time. That is, that there's no female around and that it's time for one of the members of the population to become the female. So that's one form of, that's not temperature dependent sex determination, that's social sex determination. But both, in both cases, there are no genes involved in choosing, deciding sex. It's something else, it's about nurture, it's about the environment, it's not about genetics, it's not about nature in some of these species. So we're in a genetics class, so we're gonna focus less on the social sex determination and environmental sex determination and more on what the genes do and what the chromosomes do. So back to the terms heterogamity and homogamity. We've already seen the, the roots of these, hetero and homo, different and same. like heterozygous and homozygous. Now we've got heterogamity and homogamity. So talking about genetically male and genetically female individuals, there are, in each of these two scenarios we're gonna talk about, one where we're gonna talk about XY males and XX females, which is the hetero gametic sex, the one that has two different types of sex chromosomes in their gametes. Male. Right, males. So that's the hetero, that's what the hetero means. They've got two different sex chromosomes. And what it really means is that they're differently sized. That is, they're, they're cited genetically obvious. In other words, if you look at a karyogram, you can tell that one of the chromosomes is bigger or smaller than the other. And that's usually how sex chromosomes are identified. It's not that we do any fancy genetics. It's you look at the chromosomes of an organism and you find out if there are a pair that are not the same size. You say, okay, they're heterogametic. They have two differently sized sex chromosomes. And so XX is the homogametic sex in XY, XX sex determination systems. Then there's another type. Does anybody know the other types of sex chromosomes? I know, I know at least one of you is interested in learning a little bit more about this. Uh, w and Z. Z and W. Specifically for birds. So there are birds and moths and butterflies. Birds and Lepidoptera are some of the most famous taxa that don't have X and Y chromosomes. They have Z and W chromosomes. So which one is the ZW sex? That would be... Females. So in these species, it's not X and Y chromosomes that control sex, it's Z and W chromosomes that control sex, and it's the opposite pattern from the XY system. For those of you that are British or Canadian, those are Z chromosomes, not Z chromosomes. So if you're male in, say, birds or butterflies, you have two Z chromosomes, and it's the females that are heterogametic. my chicken scratch up there. So heterogametic, ZW, two differently sized or two different sex chromosomes. So based on what we learned last time about how sex chromosomes work, remember we compared ZW, or sorry, XY and XX sex chromosomes in Drosophila and fruit, and Drosophila and humans, fruit flies and humans. So what is it about the Z and the W chromosomes do you think that cause femaleness? What are the difference between females and males in that system? What are the genetic differences? Females are ZW, males are ZZ. So one of two things is going to cause sex determination in those species. The Z, the w. Presence or absence of a W might do it. So females have a W chromosome, males don't. Or it's going to be the ratio of, or the number of Z chromosomes, like fruit flies do. Number of X chromosomes in fruit flies controls sex. Two X chromosomes, you're female. One X chromosome, you're male. And the same is possible here in the ZWZC system. It turns out most of the time, it's an active gene on the W chromosome. 
much like it's an active gene on the Y chromosome that causes maleness, in ZW systems it's often, although not necessarily always, a female determining gene on the W chromosome. So a female determining gene. Right. SRY on the Y chromosome in humans starts male development. And usually, or at least sometimes, a female determining gene on the, on the uh, W chromosome will cause female development in birds, Lepidoptera, and other species that also have ZW chromosomes. Any questions? Oh, why X? Because it looks like an X? Brief historical perspective. It turned out that in Drosophila, so fruit flies, this was around, you don't need to remember this, it's around 1900s when microscopy started to be good enough that you could actually see chromosomes under a microscope. One of the earliest Drosophila geneticists recognized that females had two of a particular chromosome that they could observe and see, distinguish, and that males only had one of that shape and size of chromosome, so they called it like the X factor, not like the TV show but like the unknown thing. It was something they could see that was different between males and females. And so uh, that was the X chromosome, the unknown chromosome. It's doing something to sex determination. We don't know what it was. And then why did they call the Y chromosome the Y chromosome? According to legend, it's because it's the letter that comes after X. So then when ZW and ZZ systems were discovered where there's female sex determination gene, they just called those the, the letters that were closest to X and Y, which was Z and W. So there's no real meaning behind it. It's all just nomenclature that has to be memorized. So to practice, let me introduce you to some of my favorite fish, the stickleback fish. We may have talked about this at one point early in the semester. So this is a group of fish. The three spine sticklebacks are shown in the picture. The brightly colored guy is a guy. It's a male, XY. And above him is an XX female. So in this species, when the males are ready to mate, that sex determining gene, they don't have SRY. They have a different gene that controls maleness. But they do have one Y chromosome that controls male development. When it's time to mate, then that gene turns on the expression of other genes that causes him to develop the red throat and the sort of blue, shiny back. His eyes turn blue. And that's the signal to the females that he's ready to copulate. And then he tries to court the females and get them to mate with him. And there are multiple species of stickleback. So here's the three-spine stickleback. Well, actually. This is the three spine because there are three spines on its back, one, two, and a little tiny one. So the three spine sticklebacks, they're close relatives, the four spine sticklebacks. Guess what comes next? No, there are no five spine sticklebacks. There's a nine spine stickleback, though. <laughs> and there's the, let's see, three spine, four spine. This one is called the brook stickleback. They didn't bother, they stopped counting spines at some point. <laughs> And, oh, that's the black spotted stickleback. Oh, my goodness, my dissertation advisor is going to have a fit. I don't remember these all by sight anymore. This is the brook stickleback. This is the black spotted stickleback. Guess why? OK. So what I'm going to show you next, and what you can see now if you're looking at these slides, you don't need to remember those. I'm just introducing you to the team of people that we're going to look at, team of fish that we're going to look at next. Try to figure out, our goal now for this class is to figure out whether or not these groups have heteromorphic or homomorphic sex chromosomes and whether they're XY or ZW. So this is all getting to that goal task of looking at a karyogram and trying to decide what sex and is it heterogametic or homogametic.
let's see. So this is the chromosome spread from, I better look at my notes just to make sure, the black-spotted stickleback. So this is one of those species. And what I can tell you is, let's see. Can you tell if, any, if either of these panels, top or bottom, has heteromorphic chromosomes, differently sized, a differently sized pair? It's sort of set apart. The, there's a weird thing about the black spotted sticklebacks. They have an odd number of chromosomes, which is not supposed to happen in a diploid. You're supposed to have an even number of chromosomes. But they've got a really interesting situation going on. So that is the heteromorphic sex, whichever sex that spread came from. And the bottom panel is homomorphic. There are no differently shaped chromosome pairs, so we can't tell if they've got a sex chromosome system. So what's the last thing I need to tell you before you can tell me whether or not these chromosomes are X's and Y's or Z's and W's? Right, what, what sex of individual did those chromosomes come from? Those came from a male. <coughs> and the bottom ones were chromosomes that I photographed from a female. So, what are the chromosomes circled in blue? Are they X's and Y's or Z's and W's? Z if they came from a male, then they're X and Y's. You don't know which is which. Which do you think is the Y chromosome? Normally it would be, but in the black spotted stickleback, it's not. It's actually, this is weird. Don't freak out. That's the Y chromosome, and it has two different X chromosomes. Oh. Dun, dun, dun. So don't worry about that. That's not going to be on a test. But an important point that I'm trying to make on this slide, and I'll make again in a couple slides from now, is that the sex chromosome is not always the smallest one. It's true in humans, but that's because our sex chromosome has been around and falling apart for 300 million years. This sex chromosome system has been around about 10 million years. So it's about 30 times younger than the human sex chromosomes, and so it hasn't yet had, the Y chromosome hasn't had a chance really to do its falling apart thing. So that means that somewhere down here, one of those pairs is a pair of X chromosomes. I don't know which one it is. It's one of them. That's the tricky thing about homomorphic chromosomes is you never know which ones are the Xs unless you have a molecular test for it. But it's pretty obvious which ones are the heteromorphic pair because they're the ones that don't match any of the other chromosomes when you make a karyogram. Any questions or concerns about this one? We've got two more examples to do, so a little bit of practice. Yeah? So you determined it was X and Y because you <laughs> specified that it came from a male? Yes. How, uh, what would you say that, uh, that would lead us to the conclusion that it was WZ? Okay, so, if, if, so good question. What happens when it's a ZW system? What would we, what would we have to see there? You'd have to see a heteromorphic pair in a female individual. And the way that I knew that those fish were males and females is because I looked at their gonads. So I could see physically that those were males and females that those chromosomes came out of. Likewise, let's see, what do we have here? I need to figure out which, which species this was, too, because I can't remember this stuff. This is nine-spine stickleback. So different species, close relative, but a different species. And the top panel came from a female, and the bottom panel came from a male. Phenotypically female and male. The fish on top had ovaries and was making oocytes. The fish on the bottom was making sperm and had testes. So which is the heterogametic sex? Yeah, you're going to get tricked into always looking in the upper right-hand corner <laughs> because that's where these always tend to be placed, either there or in the bottom right-hand corner. So these are XY or ZW chromosomes. XY. They're XY. It's a differently sized pair if it comes from a male that's an X and a Y. And again, strangely, this is not always the case, the X is the smaller one and the Y is the larger one. 
You wouldn't know that just by looking at it. So that will not be something that I can ask you to determine. All we care about is that there are two chromosomes that are differently sized, and that indicates that one of them is a sex chromosome. Don't know which. So that's heteromorphic, and that means the female is homomorphic. No distinguishable pair of chromosomes that look different. Finally, this better be the four-spine stickleback. Yes. So four-spine stickleback. One more chance to practice. The bottom spread is from a male, and the top spread is from a female. So that makes the heteromorphic pair Z and W, we don't know which is which. The fact that they're differently sized means one of them is one and one of them is the other. We need more information to know which. And that means the male's sex chromosomes are, they're either, this is just something you have to remember. It's either ZZ or WW, ZZ. In other words, the Z is the equivalent to an X chromosome in humans. It's the one that differs in number between the sexes in a ZZZW system. And I don't know which pair. Let's pick a pair at random. That could be the Zs. I don't know. Whatever, whatever it is, it should look the same as whatever the Z chromosome looks like in the top panel. Again, without more molecular information, like getting the sequences of these chromosomes, there is no way to know which is which. Right. So you know the sex of the individual, the phenotypic sex of the individual, look for a heteromorphic sex chromosome pair, and then the combination of those two pieces of information tells you if it's a ZW or an XY system. So all mammals have an XY system. All mammals, every mammalian species, except for a couple of weird ex exceptions, there are some mice that do some weird things that are not typical for XY systems. But in this one group of fish, these are all the same family of fish, different genera. So they're a little bit genetically and ecologically and evolutionarily distinct. But they have four different types of sex chromosome systems. I didn't show you the fourth one. But there's the XY system, there's a ZW system, and then there's the one with the two X chromosomes, X1, X2, Y. So for some reason that nobody knows, sex chromosomes in fish are extremely, we call plastic. Sex chromosomes are able to change really quickly from species to species, which is not true in humans and other mammals. So any questions about any of that sex chromosome information? Plenty of chance next class to ask more questions about it as well. So finish up chi-square analysis, or maybe finish it up. There were a few questions that I asked you to prepare or work on for today. Here's one of them. Does anybody have an answer or a question about this? College friend has three kids in a row. My college friend, true story, not surprisingly, have three kids and they're all girls. So what's the probability that their next kid, if they had one, would be a boy? 50%. Right. It doesn't have anything to do with the past. The past is the past. Every time you have a kid, there's a 50-50 chance, assuming that the dad is XY, there's a 50% chance that the next kid would be a son. So the, the statistical question then is, how many times do you have to have kids and try to have a son before you say, dad, there's something statistically significantly wrong with your sperm? Right, when the, yeah, you have to get a p-value of less than 0.05. P-value, yes. Okay, yeah, exactly, maybe I shouldn't go there. So, is it statistically significant that they had three kids, three girls in a row? Data set's not large enough, but if you want to answer that question rigorously, what do you have to do? Have a lot more kids. 
Yeah, that would help. But with the data we have, set up a chi-square test. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but hopefully this is what you did. You've got zero boys and three girls observed, and you'd expect 50-50, so half, one and a half boys and one and a half girls. So if you do that chi-square test, the p-value winds up being, I think it's about 0 0.08, if I remember correctly. It's about 0 0.08. So it's close to significant, but it's not significantly different than what you'd expect. So we can't rule out that just chance. Three times in a row you flipped a coin and the coin was heads. <coughs> X chromosome in the sperm. So the, the last question, the next question is more important in terms of what you might be asked to do on some future exam or in real life, especially as scientists. Because when we do experiments, we have to know that we're doing enough replication, as was just mentioned, we have to know that we're going to do an experiment enough times that if there is a significant difference, we would have done the experiment enough times to have observed it. And we don't do an experiment once, because if we do an experiment once and we get one answer, we don't know if that answer we just got because that's chance or because that's the real answer. We have to do the experiment some number of times and see the same answer again and again and again to develop enough confidence in our experiment that we say, okay, this must be, this is statistically significantly what happens? That's the outcome of this experiment, most or all of the time. So how many times would you have to have kids and one sex, boy or girl, in a row before it's statistically significantly different than chance? What would you do? I mean, how would you solve this problem? If you were the couple and you had one more kid and it was a girl, then how would the chi-square table change? Zero boys, four girls. Two each. So then the expectation is two each. So then you redo the chi-square test. And you find out, has the p-value dropped below 0.05? And you just keep doing that until you get to a p-value that's lower than 0.05. And it turns out, in this example, this is as far as you need to go. Because zero and four is statistically significantly different. It's just below 0.05. Now, I, I hope I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to convince you that if you know somebody who has four kids that are all the same genetic sex, that you should go running to them and say, hey, I think you've got a problem with your sperm. <laughs> because even statistically significant differences can be just chance. This means there's a 5% chance, P of 0 0.05, roughly speaking, means there's a 5% chance that you get four girls in a row I want to say by bad luck, that's not what I mean. That's what I was going to say. I probably shouldn't have said it at all. Now it's on a recording. But I hope you understand what I'm trying to say, which is that if you are expecting an even sex ratio and you see one sex four times in a row, that's unlikely, but it's not impossible. And that's what this five, P of 0 0.05 means. About, there's a 5% chance, looking at four kids, that you would have four of the same sex just by chance. Because occasionally, even though we didn't see it in this room when we did the poker chip flipping activity, if you have enough people in a room flipping coins enough times, you'll see one that comes up heads ten times in a row. It's not likely, but it could happen. And we already talked about this, so I'm not going to go over it again, other than to mention what I meant by this question, what is the expectation for independent assortment in meiosis, is getting back to that question of if there's an XY, just as an example, cell that undergoes meiosis, the expectation is that half of the gametes will get one chromosome and half the other homolog. So that could be X's and Y's, or it could be chromosome one. We could do it a different way. We could say that that's chromosome one paternal and maternal. You'd expect the same outcome in those gametes as well one paternal in two gametes, chromosome one maternal in the other two gametes. This, for ex to be explicit, is spermatogenesis because I've drawn all the gametes equally sized. But this happens in female gametogenesis as well. And where we're going to head eventually with this, but I like to start with chi-square and meiosis first, before we get to Punnett squares, is there's a combination. 
because you've got chromosomes 1 and X and Y chromosomes that are going into gametes independently of each other. Mendel's second law of independent assortment, which means that half of the X chromosomes will get the chromosome 1 from dad, and the other half will get chromosome 1 from mom, and the same will happen in gametes that get Y chromosomes. Half of the Ys will get chromosome 1 that's the paternal version, and the other half the chromosome 1 with the maternal version. We haven't gone through that in detail yet, but that's where we're headed when we get to Mendelian genetics towards the end of the semester, which we're kind of almost at. So that's independent assortment. We expect a random distribution of all possible chromosome allele distributions. Don't freak out yet. That's just the first introduction to that in class. We're going to get into it in detail in a couple of weeks. So, for more practice on chi-square tests, I did, at the start of class, distribute on Google Classroom a practice. It's a Google sheet that's got six or seven tabs down at the bottom. You can click on different questions. If you want more practice. If you want to practice doing, I've developed a different bunch of different questions related to chi-square analysis. It's not worth points. I'll post the answer key, which is also a Google sheet, on Friday. So take your time. If you want to practice, you can check the answers against that key when it comes out. And... Uh, we'll do this question 8.4 next time. This is us into the next topic. We're going to start the central dogma, finally, transcription and translation. So more to read and more videos to watch for next class, and one more exercise to try, please. See you next time.